good morning, everybody. Um, um, at least good morning to those of you who are in California. Um, and uh, with whatever else part of the day it is where you're attending from. Um, my name is David Marno. I'm in the English department here at Berkeley. But I am uh, speaking today as uh, um, the co-director of the Berkeley Center for the Study of Religion, which is uh, very proud and honored uh, and glad um, to host uh, today's event. Um, and I'm simply a sort of master of ceremony here, so I will disappear within a few minutes uh, from your view, uh, but I wanted to use this opportunity to, uh, to say just a word about uh, the Center for the Study of Religion in part, and specifically about this initiative, uh, uh, a part of which is uh, today's conversation. Um, the initiative is called uh, uh, Democracy and Public Theology. It is uh, supported by a generous grant uh, uh, from the Henry Luce Foundation. And it is going to include a series of talks, workshops, and all kinds of other events, uh, mostly uh, open to the public. Uh, and the one that I want to plug specifically here is actually organized uh, and is going to be launched uh, next fall, I believe. But um, 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 Emily and Duncan can correct me, Professor uh, Emily McHill and uh, and Duncan McCree uh, can correct me if I'm wrong about this, uh, but uh, I believe it will be launched in the fall and will focus on voting as a religious act uh, in classical antiquity. So uh, we would be very excited if uh, as many of you um, um, could uh, join us for that as possible. And um, for um, this event um, and for all future events, uh, you can uh, visit uh, the BCSR's website um, at uh, bcsr.berkeley.edu. Um, I want to say just a word about uh, do, uh, the two moderators of, uh, of today's event uh, who are going to introduce our two guest panelists, uh, but my colleagues, uh, again, Professor Emily McKill um, and Professor um, Duncan McRae um, um, are, um, I think, uh, one of the reasons, like they are such uh, great examples of the reason for BCSR to exist, uh, which is to bring together people who work uh, on different facets of religion, but from different disciplines mm -hmm. um, on the Berkeley campus that does not actually have uh, um, a religious studies department. Uh, and we really want to foster collaboration between uh, Berkeley professors uh, and graduate students, as well as uh, obviously graduate students and professors from outside of Berkeley. Um, so Professor Emil McKill is Professor of History and Chair of the Department. Um, um, and uh, her first book, Creating a Common Polity, uh, focused on, uh, on Greek federal states and very much in entanglement uh, with, uh, with religious uh, rituals. Uh, and actually one of the provocative arguments of that book is precisely that, uh, that uh, the federation, the federal system was not just uh, for defense purposes, but for other purposes as well. Um, and, uh, and Professor McCall is working on uh, property um, and ownership uh, right now. Uh, professor, um, and this would be a longer introduction in normal situations, but we have four speakers, so I don't want to take up too much of our time. Um, professor Duncan McRae is a professor of classics here at Berkeley. Um, and uh, his book, his first book, Legible Religion, is, um, is a really fascinating study, actually, of uh, of, um, of, the, of the role of texts um, in uh, Roman religions. Uh, so what uh, the book is arguing for is that uh, Christianity, Judaism, and Islam may still hold a claim on, uh, on being uh, religions of the book, uh, but Roman religions were also religions uh, of, if not the book, but uh, books. That is to say that uh, that written uh, sophisticated theological works were very much part of, uh, of Roman religions as well. Um, so these are two great examples of, uh, of colleagues uh, here in the Berkeley campus uh, working on, uh, again, different facets of, uh, of religion. Um, it is with great pleasure um, that I will turn the word over to uh, Professor uh, McKeel. I will just say one uh, technical, uh, I will just call our audience's attention to one technical issue, which is that um, um, the Q&A is going to work uh, by uh, written submissions. So uh, you will see that uh, um, the Q&A function will, uh, well, you can also find it on the bottom of your screen, um, on the right side of your screen. 
Uh, but it will also pop up and you can write and submit questions uh, and our panelists will um, address those questions at the end of uh, the conversation. So it is uh, my honor to, to turn the word over to, to Professor McKill. Thank you so much, David, for uh, for opening up this event and and for your your very kind um, introduction. Um, it is uh, it's a great pleasure for me uh, to to be participating in this event. Um, uh, this conversation, as as David mentioned, uh, was organized by uh, the the BCSR's uh, Democracy and Public Theology program, which is funded by this generous grant from the Luce Foundation. Um, uh, so at the core of this program about democracy and public theology that the BCSR is, is hosting over the next uh, uh, three years um, are, are these fundamental questions. How has religion intersected with democratic culture and practice in the past? And how does it do so today? Can we, the, the program is kind of asking, are, are there ways that we can think about this intersection of democracy and public theology or ways of thinking and talking about religious belief and practice um, that might help us to forge a stronger democratic future. So it was in pursuit of the question about the past, right? How has this happened in democratic cultures in the past that we uh, thought to invite two experts in the history of um, the earliest democratic experiment, that of ancient Athens, to talk with us this morning. So that was the kind of rationale behind putting together this conversation. Uh, so Sara Forsdyke is professor of classical studies and history at the University of Michigan. Um, she is the author of three monographs. The first uh, called Exile, Ostracism and Democracy, The Politics of Expulsion in Ancient Greece. And then uh, two books about uh, slaves and slavery in ancient Greece. One really thinking about um, politics and popular culture and the other, uh, which I think is just forthcoming, uh, uh, um, a, a broader study of slavery uh, in ancient Greece. Um, She's also working on a study of trial by jury in ancient Athens and contemporary America. Um, and this is a practice, of course, that's as central to democratic governance as it is to legal process. And I uh, hope that, that that'll come out uh, today and we'll hear a little bit um, about her, her thoughts um, there, both, both um, uh, historical and, and contemporary. Um, as David said, in a normal setting, we might, I, I might go on at, at greater length. Berkeley is sort of famous for very long introductions, um, but I, I want to I get into the, the meat of the conversation. So, so Sara, welcome. Um, uh, our other <clears throat> guest is uh, Josh Ober, who is professor of classics and political science and by courtesy of philosophy at <clears throat> an institution a few of you in the Bay Area have heard of, Stanford. Um, but he is joining us from the mountains of Montana, <clears throat> if memory serves. Um, <clears throat> Uh, and uh, Josh is the author of a highly influential trilogy of books about the nature of Athenian democracy. Um, the first, Mass and Elite in Democratic Athens, really changed the way people uh, thought and talked about <coughs> ancient democracy, introducing these <coughs> terms of mass and elite as ways of sort of thinking about how, um, how different groups uh, in ancient Athens uh, uh, negotiated their positions. <clears throat> the second, political dissent in democratic Athens uh, uh, studied the very <clears throat> important but challenging issue of how people criticized democracy uh, in the ancient world. <clears throat> and then the third, democracy and knowledge, innovation and learning in classical Athens uh, uh, tackled head on this sort of problem that we face in which the radical uh, Athenian democracy um, has been criticized and was criticized in antiquity for having kind of an expertise problem. <clears throat> um, uh, and uh, so he tackled that, that issue in that, that third uh, big book about the Athenian democracy. Josh has written many more, uh, uh, more books and uh, more articles, um, but from this history and history of political thought, he's moved now into the realm of normative political theory, uh, writing about democracy's wisdom and democracy's dignity, as well as a recent book about democracy before liberalism. Uh, Josh was <clears throat> the Sather uh, professor in the Department of Classics 
at, at Berkeley last fall. So we had uh, the pleasure of, a, of an extended uh, visit from him uh, where he spoke um, about uh, rationality in, uh, in Greek culture and the Athenian democracy in particular. Uh, so I think some of those themes will, will also come out today. So welcome, Josh. Welcome, Sarah. Thank you very much for joining us. It's a great pleasure. Um, uh, so we're living in a pretty extraordinary and difficult moment right now. Um, and to speak only about the aspects of our current predicament that, that um, relate to today, we've heard uh, the credibility and value of some of our most deeply cherished democratic norms and practices being attacked and undermined by those in the highest offices of the US government. Uh, the security and integrity of our votes have been cast into doubt. The peaceful transition of power that should accompany the election of a new president can't even be taken for granted right now. Um, minority positions taken uh, sometimes within religious communities have come to dominate our politics and seem to threaten the democratic norm of majority rule. Rationality and science are being eschewed in favor of ideology as leaders attempt to respond to the overwhelming pressure of the pandemic. Um, and so this is the, con the, the context in which we're all living and thinking uh, uh, about, um, uh, about the world and the, the, the background, I guess, to our conversation today, or at least part of it. Um, so the election is more or less already underway, right? We know that millions of people have already uh, voted. Um, uh, voters are making choices about the future in response to the conditions of the past and the conditions of the present. And we recognize, especially as teachers uh, of ancient history, that Americans have often turned to ancient Athens to think about their own democratic experience. So I, I thought we might just open this conversation um, by thinking, or, or I might just ask you why you think that is, um, and whether it's right that we should do so um, before, before we turn into to more specific sort of Athenian questions. Well, uh, if I could start, um, maybe I would just note that uh, the Athenian democracy has not always stood as a, an example in America. The founding fathers, of course, rejected the example of democratic Athens in favor of the uh, mixed government of Republican Rome. And it was really only, <laughs> yay. and in the 19th century, it was, it was really only in the 19th century when democracy became um, something positive and that the Athenian democracy somehow was elevated to um, an exemplar uh, for thinking about American politics. So um, just to point out that historically it's been, been a relatively recent phenomenon of thinking about Athenian democracy as a model for American democracy. And I guess I would say that Athenian democracy for me um, can serve as a kind of a uh, uh, an example that we can learn about the perils as well as the possibilities of democracy. Um, we can think of in terms of perils the the warning that Plato gave us about the uh, slippage uh, from democracy to tyranny or authoritarian kinds of regimes and how easily that can happen uh, in a democracy. And then we can think about the possibilities of democracy. For me, is most important is uh, citizen engagement. The possibility of full uh, realization of the meaning of democratic citizenship um, is uh, something that, that Athens achieves and can serve as a model for us in thinking about how we can make our democracy more participatory through citizen assemblies and so forth. Um, I guess, uh, as you've mentioned already, uh, I'm very interested in the trial by jury and uh, I hope we get a chance to talk about that in more detail, but I do think that Athens stands as a model for why trial by jury is important, both for equal protection of the law and full engagement with our democracy. You're muted. So Sara is exactly right that uh, uh, the norm in the 18th century was to see Athens as a negative example. Uh, there were outliers. Um, Tom Paine, for example, said that America will be in uh, a majesty what uh, Athens was in miniature, um, but he was very much uh, an outlier at that time. And then it really is in the 19th century um, with sort of the rise of classical studies and Hellenism especially as a uh, really central part of the 
curriculum, especially humanistic curriculum, that Athens really becomes uh, a model um, um, that uh, people begin to think of Athens as uh, a positive model for uh, democracy. I think that at least one reason to continue to be interested in Athens is that there are very few historical examples of long-term democracies that can be carefully studied. Um, so uh, it's really quite rare and quite precious to have an example of a democracy that was not developed under the very special conditions of modernity. Um, and it allows us to test various theories about what democracy can be, what is possible, is um, something like uh, uh, rational governance for a complex society um, possible over time uh, without bringing in um, the various apparatus um, uh, that is unique to modernity, technological um, population size, um, and so on. So I think there are reasons to continue to um, study Athens, um, even though uh, there are reasons to be very um, concerned about uh, in any way making a one-to-one -one mapping. We certainly do not want to Athens. Um, uh, I hope I had to say this various times in my career. I do not want to live in Athens. I do not want to live in a slave society. I do not want to live in a society in which women are systematically excluded from political participation and so on. Um, but there still is, I think, um, a lot we can gain by thinking seriously about um, uh, a pre-modern example of uh, rule, direct rule by the people over time um, through very difficult conditions. I, I think you made that exact point uh, in your say the lectures uh, here, Josh, um, in 2019, um, which which brings up those say the lectures. Um, and um, your, your say the lecture argument it goes much further than this. But one of the arguments you made there and it builds on, on some of the earlier work that uh, Emily mentioned at the beginning, um, was that um, we should um, think about how democratic decision-making Athens was rational, um, despite those criticisms by both ancients and moderns, um, that ancient Athens seems a bit uh, out of control, a bit irrational. Um, so perhaps you can tell us more about that argument, why, why it is that you see that Athenian democracy uh, uh, as rational. Yeah, indeed. Um, I think that rationality is one of these complicated um, uh, concepts that we have to break down uh, before we can really answer that question. So I tend to see it as in three different forms. There's scientific rationality um, that is really concerned with uh, the either deductive reasoning from unquestioned premises or at least uh, generally agreed upon premises deductively through to uh, results. So you think about oh, how mathematics works, for example. Um, uh, or there's a, a scientific empirical uh, rationality in which you have observations that are done in various ways that are agreed upon to be um, uh, uh, correct. And then you um, uh, look for regularities um, uh, in observation. So scientific rationality is looking for some kind of a correspondence with some kind of a, a, a reality. Um, uh, there's then what I call ethical rationality or moral rationality, and this is what Plato was after. And Plato thought in order to be, or Aristotle, various others of the um, philosophers, to be ethically rational, you had to have the right desires for the right ends, right? So if you desire the wrong things, you desire, say, wealth or you know, uh, uh, various kind of uh, accolades, um, uh, uh, you know, um, fame, and so on. Um, then, in, then you're you're irrational from the get-go, according to Plato. You need to have the desires for the right kind of things, and then you need to have for Plato the right kind of beliefs that is correct beliefs um, uh, attached to those desires, so that you can pursue your correct desires based on correct beliefs. Um, and if you have the right desires and um, true beliefs, then you can have true rationality. That turns out to be extremely demanding uh, for Plato. Most of us are not rational by Plato's standards. And so you need ultimately to have rational rulers 
the philosopher kings who can then run everything for all the rest of us. So it ends up being um, fundamentally anti-democratic. The, the third kind of rationality is what I'd call instrumental rationality. And that simply means to um, uh, connect your coherent desires, that is desires that are rank ordered, such as if you desire A more than B and B more than C, you do not desire C more than A. That would be, you know, irrational. Um, but as long as you have rationally rank ordered desires and coherent beliefs, which aren't necessarily true, but they're not illogical. You don't believe A and not A at the same time. Um, so if you have rank ordered um, uh, desires and coherent beliefs and you act according to that rank ordered desires and beliefs in order to gain ends based on estimations of likelihoods and what other people are going to do, then your behavior is rational. The point here is that you could have behavior that you and I, I think, and most people might agree is, are, is vicious, can be rational. Um, behavior that can be, seem to be hypocritical um, is rational. Behavior that ignores what we would accept as scientific truth can be rational in this third sense. And then this third sense, I think, is one that is quite important to think about how do democratic systems or non-democratic systems achieve at least instrumental rationality. Because if they can't achieve instrumental rationality, then the notion that a people, a demos, could collectively achieve what it desires goes out the window. Um, uh, so instrumental rationality is in many ways not enough for what a world we might want to live in. But it's a pretty important baseline because if we haven't got that, we're not going to be able to have anything like a democratic system. Um, and so I, uh, I'm going to wonder whether you can tell us a little bit more how that plays out within Athens. So um, what, what maybe picking an example, because of course our time here is limited, um, sure. as in some part of the Athenian democracy that you see lives up to this kind of at least institutional rationality of um, producing um, a, a sort of result dependent on those those kind of ordered preferences. Yeah, uh, indeed. So the um, basic uh, problem that rationality offers when you think about or this instrumental rationality offers when you think about democracy is how can you get a lot of people with diverse preferences to make a judgment on some matter that is ultimately rational, that ends in an outcome. Um, so how can a mass of people act like a rational individual, right? Um, uh, and that's really demand, that's quite demanding. And this is one of the reasons that there've been many challenges to the rationality of democracy from Plato up to modern 21st century economists who say that democracy is in various ways irrational. Um, uh, so the Athenians did it, um, uh, I think, in two ways. Institutionally, um, through developing some quite clever mechanisms uh, which allowed for the mass of people gathered in either a council or in an assembly to begin to converge on a agreed upon policy uh, that could be seen as being in their common interests. But those institutions were also dependent upon the development of a culture that allowed Athenians to recognize that they did have interests in common, um, even though they have diverse preferences over many things, they had common interests on some things. And so the um, culture had to make it possible for people to recognize that they were on the same page on some basic things, let's say security or basic welfare, even while they diverge very substantially over all of the various particularities. So the institutions that are devised for the decision-making process, for example, in the assembly or the law courts, as Sarah can talk about, um, are really 
essential, but they build on a background culture um, that is also essential. And that's where various religious rituals come into the story, I think, because they're certainly very much part of building that common culture um, that allows diverse people with very different interests to see themselves as part of the same community on some deeper level. One, one example to sort of fill that out a bit might be there's a there's an ephibic oath, which is an oath um, sworn by um, the young men of the democracy on their compulsory military service, at least in the fourth century. There's some controversy about when they started swearing such an oath. And th this oath um, is, is very dramatic. It's a religious oath with mentions of the gods of Glaurus and Hestia and Ares and even um, swear the, the young men swore on the boundaries of their of their ancestral land and on the wheat and on the barley and on the grapevines. Um, so you would see that as kind of um, that kind of oath, which obviously has some kind of re relevance to something like the Pledge of Allegiance in the American context. You see that kind of oath as one of the, the sort of mechanisms for encouraging um, exactly that kind of instrumental, rational, uh, democratic outcome. Yeah, very much so. Uh, or if you think about the um, uh, uh, less uh, uh, annual uh, uh, speech that is given over the year's war dead, uh, the funeral oration famously given by Thucydides in the first year of the Peloponnesian War, but given basically almost every year because there are war dead in almost every year. Uh, so that, once again, here you have a chance for the Athenians to listen to what in some ways seem to be, you know, Pericles' speech is a bit of an outlier, but seem to be sort of banalities about you know, who we are, who we Athenians are, what we do, why it matters. And they hear this year after year, and I think this is actually quite important. They actually have a place where they can, as it were, come together and listen to somebody who is chosen him through a democratic process to give that speech to then once again reiterate what it is that we have that is in common given that recognize that we don't have in common where it's a very competitive society a very a society that sees um, a contest as being at its center so that driving together to some kind of a cooperative center that is based on a um, shared understanding of who we are um, is pretty necessary for that for that kind of balance I wonder if I could just jump in here and thinking about um, the, the you, you've sketched out for us these three different types of rationality. Um, and I think drawing those distinctions so clearly is really helpful. Um, and uh, you've described instrumental rationality as this kind of a baseline that's still difficult to achieve, but that through coordination, it, 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 uh, its presence can facilitate um, democratic decision making. Um, it occurs to me that in, in the modern world, at least, we might lean on, or some people might lean on uh, a kind of a, a religious, religiously oriented ethics to try to get a community from this sort of baseline of strategic rationality or instrumental rationality toward this higher rationality that Plato was after, right? The, the ethical rationality. And I, it strikes me that um, this, is, this is a dynamic that worked really, really differently in antiquity, right? Um, famously, Plato could attack practiced religion uh, because of its, um, because it was in so many cases devoid of uh, what he saw as, as truly ethical positions, right? The myths about the gods creating, uh, committing all kinds of what we might call crimes, right? Um, misdeeds. Uh, and so it's, there is a way in which, I, I, maybe I could just sort of throw it back at you and ask you whether there are ways in which um, religious practice per se in antiquity might have helped the Athenians to get from that baseline of strategic rationality towards something more like an ethical, uh, ethical rationality. Sarah, do you want, want to go in on this? Or? Go ahead. 
Okay, so it's a, I think that that really was one of the big differences between ancient and modern. I think that the, for the antiquity, um, uh, or for the Athenians, um, religion certainly was a way that people could align their interests. They could develop a kind of common knowledge um, of who we are, and common knowledge is uh, interesting. Uh, uh, a problem within social science, but basically mm -hmm. it's a matter of you knowing something and I know that you know it and you know that I know it and um, this is mutual. Uh, so that religious practice, especially reiterated practices like the processions, um, uh, sacrifices done together, created a kind of common knowledge. Um, so we know some of the same things about one another, about our presence, but um, uh, it didn't have the same sort of moral uh, uh, features that uh, uh, we think about the uh, religious, uh, the, the contemporary um, uh, revealed religions um, uh, are, uh, is at the center of those, of those traditions. Um, I think this is what really opens up the space for um, the kind of uh, philosophical, ethical, moral, philosophical work that, um, that Plato and Aristotle feel is so important, um, is they worry that the background um, intuitions and shared rituals and so on that the Athenians um, uh, and other people in other Greek city-states are engaged in don't have an adequate ethical basis. Um, uh, so that the ethics has to be, in a sense, popular ethics. It has to be um, what everybody around here agrees is the wrong sort of thing to do or the wrong way to behave. Or the, um, uh, and they worry that that's um, actually not, not good enough um, uh, and that it might even be undercut by stories about the gods as opposed to rituals that we do um, uh, to, to, to honor the gods. Um, so I think this is one way in which the, um, uh, the philosophical tradition um, that emerged from uh, uh, in the in strongly in Athens, um, uh, really saw itself as having to correct something that was missing there um, in uh, the religious tradition, uh, in a way that the um, uh, revealed religions felt that or the, the, the nature of revealed religion is to have those kinds of philosophical concerns built right into it. Um, so you get uh, early on in um, Judaism and Christianity, a very strong conception um, of Islam as well, a very strong conception of, of, uh, of ethics um, uh, based on, a, on moral grounding. So I, I just see this as a, as a fundamental difference, but I'm, there may be similarities that I'm, I'm missing. Yeah, I would just emphasize that religion and politics were so tightly intertwined in the ancient world. There was no separation there. And you can think of, you know, that they were, uh, they were the, fam the Athenians were famous for the number of religious festivals they had during the year, 150 days or something, were dedicated towards um, various kinds of uh, worship of the gods, um, festival celebrations. Um, you know, they started this assembly meeting by sacrificing a pig and purifying it purifying the assembly. Um, they started with curses against traitors that, um, and treaties between states were, um, were confirmed through oaths sworn to the gods uh, on, pain of uh, on penalty of divine retribution. So there's so many ways that politics and, and religion are intertwined. And I guess um, one, one thing I would say is that, that religion and politics were not always um, antagonistic, um, that it didn't mean that, uh, that the, we can take an example actually that Josh was talking about a few weeks ago at a conference we were both at about the, um, the oracle of the wooden walls, right? Um, one of the points that Josh made, uh, this is the um, Battle of uh, Salamis um, in 480 BCE. And this is when the Athenians receive an oracle saying that they, their strategy should be to um, seek protection behind the wooden walls. And Themistocles famously interprets that as the ships and they get on their ships and defend, them, defend Athens at sea. Um, but interestingly, the um, sort of religious experts in that uh, episode uh, had a different interpretation of the oracle, but the Athenian assembly decided to go with the um, decision of the demos uh, or the, the proposal of the Themistocles and the, to, to mount the ships. Um, so they, they were capable of resisting their religious authorities as well as um, 
as, as um, celebrating religion as a very important cohesive force, as Josh is talking about, I think this role that civic religion played in bringing the people together and uh, creating a common sense of uh, identity and purpose. Yeah, exactly so. I mean, this is a, uh, I think, an interesting case in which the democracy is quite different from other forms of uh, pre-modern government that we know. Uh, is it, and I think Herodotus, in his account of the decision-making before Salamis, is very clear on this, uh, that the uh, uh, religious specialists, the interpreters of oracles, um, said, you know, here's what we got to do, you know, got to got to get out, you know, that uh, we'll die uh, if we, if we uh, uh, try to fight uh, at sea. Um, and that you suppose that in any traditional society in which religious authorities are authoritative, in which their um, decision is authoritative, that would be the end of it. Uh, uh, but uh, the striking thing is, is that that was not the end of it. Um, and that there's uh, Themistocles manages to win the day because he comes up with a better interpretation of the oracle than the so-called experts. Uh, so it's one of the fascinating things then about democracy is that um, the ways in which the kind of claims to expertise are established. And this is another real difference between um, Athens and uh, at least various other um, uh, pre-modern societies and that, that religious authorities in various pre-modern societies um, uh, are truly authoritative, whereas there is no authoritative religious voice um, uh, in Athens other than that of the um, decision of the, of the people itself. The, the Salamis episode is so fascinating because uh, that was actually the second oracle that they received. They got the first one was so terrifying that they said, "No, no, we 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 actually can't live with that one. We need to go back and get another one." Um, and then there is this whole process of of discussion, argument, interpretation uh, about what that oracle meant. Um, and it, it really strikes me as we're talking about this, that there, is a, that there was a, a discourse around um, uh, religious pronouncements and predictions, right? That it was in a sense that this whole kind of domain of, um, uh, of communication, right? Between, between a civic body and the gods was as much kind of subject to negotiation um, as, as internal discussions were. Uh, and, and that seems like a, a fundamental difference. And I'm, maybe I'm, um, uh, one of the differences is that this is very much not a religion of, of the book. There is no, just giving a, a nod to, to Duncan's work, right? There, there is no absolute recognized authority. Everything has to be kind of worked out on an ad hoc basis. And while you might have, have priests and, and folks who are, are recognized for their expertise in interpreting oracles, they could also be, um, be dismissed uh, as, as hacks, more or less, right? Um, so that, it, it's very interesting to see the way in which um, uh, religion was itself a kind of sphere for, um, uh, for debate um, and, and an, instrument for making decisions. Um, and I, I mean, I'm sure you could kind of talk us through the decision tree there in the case of, of the wooden walls, and, and that would be fun if we had more time. Um, but it, it clearly is an instrumental decision about how to protect the security of the community in the way that seems like it will be most effective, regardless of what some religious experts might say the oracle actually was was trying to say. It, it, it strikes it strikes me as um, somewhat of a paradox because um, uh, on the one hand we're we're making the point quite clearly I think that religion in some way was less authoritative that there was much more scope for human interpretation debate um, religion was immersed in politics. On the other hand, um, this was an ancient society in which religion and politics were much more enveloped and um, that they were they were just completely entangled. The, the very fact that the Athenian state would turn to Delphi to figure out what to do about a, a big Persian fleet rather gives away right some of the distinctions that um, we might make. And I, I wonder if in some ways 
going back to Josh's uh, useful distinction between the different types of rationality is that um, because the revealed religions provide ethical rationality, kind of um, ends rationality or sort of value rationality, um, they, uh, they stand in a different relationship to, to, to the instrumental rationality. Um, this, this thought, I think, goes back to Machiavelli had this thought that he thought that Christianity was terrible for the Italian city-states precisely because it provided a whole bunch of ends um, that people then pursued, um, whereas it's, it, it seems that ancient religion doesn't provide ends in that sense, right? Um, it might provide some common identity. And, and Machiavelli says that about Rome is that the Roman religion was much better because it just provided identity. It didn't provide ends. It was just a useful, um, a useful thing for the politics of the state. Uh, whereas, whereas this this Christianity thing, people listen to the Pope, and then everything goes terribly for them. Um, and so, uh, we have to sort of deal with this very complicated um, distinction between the modern uh, exclusion of politics because it's uh, of religion from politics, and precisely because it's so authoritative. That's what that was the problem uh, that Machiavelli was in identifying, and then after him, many others can't etc. Um, uh, the founders of the United States, of course. Um, but in antiquity, uh, religion is everywhere, but it's less authoritative. So it's um, part of the part of the political life in a, in a really different way. So I'd like to in invite Sarah to talk a little bit about the uh, uh, she's done such wonderful work on um, popular um, uh, culture and the popular expressions of uh, street theater and so on. I mean, it seems to me that at least one of the themes in your work is that um, uh, it is possible for people in various um, uh, of the polis at Athens, but elsewhere, um, to take, as it were, religious motifs um, and use them in a way that is not official, um, uh, not part of the ordinary uh, uh, state apparatus, um, but to, in fact, uh, uh, achieve um, ends or to, to, uh, to make points that aren't being made um, out there in public. Yeah, um, uh, part of my work has been on how politics works outside the formal institutions of the state. And there I was looking at um, sort of oral forms of storytelling, popular festivity, and popular forms of justice. Um, and I'm arguing, and I argue in my work that, that all of these are a medium of politics, a medium of negotiating relations between elites and masses outside the formal institutions of the state. So that brings in religion because, of course, festivals are a prime location of popular festivity. Um, and you could think of um, festivals like the Festival of Kronos, the Kronia, is kind of a leveling festival where everybody gets out and has a big party. And uh, the, the people are, you know, there's a Saturnalia in Rome, so they're sort of descendant of that. Roman culture, um, and uh, there's kind of a role reversal. And part of my work is to show that this festival and other festivals in the ancient world and in the pre-modern world uh, more broadly have to do with um, this kind of temporary reversal of hierarchy as a way of um, sort of signaling um, to uh, elites that ultimately uh, things could be reversed um, uh, and that they need to abide by the terms of a kind of a social contract that um, make sure that uh, each side gets its just just um, just portion of the, of social goods, and so you see sometimes festival festivals going out of control and devolving into real riot and protest. And I, in my work, I highlight a particular example in archaic Megara, in sixth century Megara, where um, you know the poor break into the houses of the rich and uh, demand to be feasted. And um, the, there's occasionally these festival rituals, which are normally in in normal festival time are very um, very ritualized. They follow regular patterns, um, and they when when the festival is over, everybody goes back to the status quo, normal with, with this kind of um, political message message in mind. Um, but but sometimes they do devolve into riot and 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 real protest, and and uh, this is one of the mediums by which the, the non elites participate in politics and and sort of engage in a negotiation with elites about the distribution of social goods. So that's another area I think that Josh was trying to get at with, with um, religion uh, playing, a, playing a role in politics. Uh, can, can, since we're with you, Sarah, and we've trailed it um, so extensively already, I wonder whether we can actually talk about another, another part of democratic Athens a little bit, which is the, the, the jury trials. Um, so one thing um, I think we've signaled, signaled this already that is common to the Athenian and the American cases is that 
um, citizen citizen juries worked to um, to judge cases, to judge um, legal disputes. Um, uh, so, were uh, how did these uh, these work in Athens, and were they were they rational? Or should we think of um, jury trials as a rational kind of institution that helps <laughs> helps this kind of general rationality of freedom and democracy that Josh has been talking about? Yeah, I think the jury trial is really one of those areas that we can look at um, and really learn a lot for our modern democracy. And that's what my current project is all about. I mean, the Athenians are the first ones I argue to recognize the importance of trial by jury of peers uh, to ensure the equal protection of the law. And this goes back to the pre-democratic period, actually the time of Solon, when he established appeal to the popular assembly as um, a right of all Athenians against decisions made by judicial magistrates. So the idea is that Athenians, um, if they got a bad decision before a, an elite magistrate, they could appeal to the popular assembly um, for a review of that decision. Um, and that's really the kernel from which um, the, the right to t trial by jury um, uh, evolves in classical Athens and Cleisthenes with the foundation of the democracy and later some democratic reformers like Ephialtes and Pericles in the middle of the fifth century really strengthened this um, uh, the popular juries and formally in institutionalize them um, as a, a necessary part of ensuring that every citizen gets the equal protection of the law. Um, and also, uh, interestingly, it's really crucial to democratic citizenship. This is uh, vast numbers, thousands of uh, um, Athenians participate in the juries every, every year, 6,000 get um, allocated every year as um, jurors, and then they get randomly assigned to, to courts. So this is really the, a locus of democratic education for the ancient Athenians. Um, they go to the courts um, and they learn how to apply the laws and they learn about the norms and values of the community. And, um, and so I, I really think that the Athenians stand as a, a really um, prime example of the importance of trial by jury of peers for the equal protection of the law and democratic engagement. And um, this is really, uh, was really important for the evolution of the jury in, um, in England, but also in early America. And one of the things that's um, sort of sad to, to note is that the, the jury trial has really been undermined uh, in the criminal justice pro process today, um, both losing its um, sort of powers over not only questions of fact, but also questions of law, and, but most importantly, recently losing, uh, basically being, al being elided from the criminal justice process altogether through plea bar bargaining. Basically over 90% of, cr of criminal trials get decided by plea bargain. So there's no jury trial whatsoever. And so that right to a uh, trial by jury, which is established um, in the constitution, um, in article three of the constitution and the sixth amendment um, is, is completely being, um, elided uh, in the current system. And I, part of my work is to show that this is really a, a huge loss, not only to, for um, ensuring that everybody gets the equal protection of the law, but also a loss for our democracy and our engagement um, with uh, our society. Sorry, you're, oh, you're uh, muted. Right. Um, sorry, just to follow, follow up on that, uh, if uh, we think about the way in which the Athenians decide um, uh, uh, legal disputes outside of the jury system, um, it's also very democratic. It's either um, you can uh, get together some of your, some people's relatives on either side of the dispute, you can go off to some public place and um, agree to arbitration. Um, so then it's just a matter of agreement and but if you can't do that, um, you can go to a, a, a public arbitrator um, uh, and the public arbitrators are uh, simply um, uh, citizens over age 60 um, who are mandated to, on a regular rotation, um, uh, uh, try to arbitrate um, between disputes between citizens. Um, they come up with a possible equitable solution, um, but uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the litigants don't have to accept that solution. They can say, if either one of them says, no, we're going to go to trial, then it will go to trial. Um, so they're not being, de de they, they don't have to have every dispute immediately go to trial, which is, of course, you know, the problem of, that the prosecutors will say, well, we couldn't possibly have all of these trials. How could we do it? Um, uh, uh, take up too much time. Well, the Athenians recognize it'd be a good idea to have some way to avoid trial 
but it has to be this very democratic thing. It's a one of your just ordinary citizens is trying to use the norms of the community to decide what would be an equitable solution here. And if you think that individual arbitrator didn't do it right, you can demand a trial and go right into a trial, in which case you're going to be judged by the norms of your community. Because it is, as Sara says, um, a random selection of these 6,000 who take the oath in a given year. Um, so pretty much it's going to be the community um, uh, is going to be judging you. Um, and pretty much because it's the, uh, the jury will, will vote, it's a simple majority vote, it's going to be the median juror, the juror who's right in the middle of the distribution, if it's a tightly argued thing, is going to decide that. Um, uh, and so it really is the norms of the community that are being brought to bear on you, the potential uh, miscreant, uh, in a way that we really have lost um, uh, in, our, in, in our, own, uh, our own society. Of course, Plato thought this was a scandal because the norms of the community aren't the right norms. The right norms are the ones known by philosopher kings and so on. But it is exactly in line with um, the way the Athenians thought about things, that it really should be the norms of the community determined by um, uh, a jury of your peers um, uh, who really are are representative of the community um, that will decide uh, on uh, these important uh, matters, matters of life and death, obviously. I, I wonder just, just briefly though, one of, one of the difficulties, and we've talked about this already with Athenian democracy, is that it is um, patriarchal, right? That the, all the citizens were male, there were no female citizens, and it was also a slave society, as we've mentioned. Um, but of course, the problem with legal disputes is that women and enslaved people um, were involved in them and, and were never, would inevitably in the tangle of real life get involved in them. And, and of course, this is an issue with, with um, modern American jury trials too, particularly um, classically in, in the Deep South where um, there was all sorts of racial uh, gerrymandering of juries and, and who could be on a jury and uh, manipulation of that. Um, so I, I kind of wonder um, whether where the limits of the kind of rationality um, this is a different point, I think, to Plato's, but where the, where the limits of a, of a jury trial might come in, in terms of who's on the jury and how that, that affects or limits um, the rationality of, of such, a, such a jury system. Sorry. Yeah, I mean, the jury does, and as is well recognized in the modern era, that we need a representative cross-section of the community to um, ensure uh, equal protection of the law and the exclusion of slaves and women mean that slaves and women were not getting, in ancient Athens, we're not certainly not getting a fair hear, hearing uh, in a uh, in a jury trial. So again, to go back to Josh's point, I wouldn't want to live under the Athenian uh, democracy for that reason. But if once the citizen population is enlarged um, and, uh, and those people are in the jury pool, then I think that a trial by jury is still a model um, for for that we can aspire to and should should try to um, to reinsert in our in our process. No, I don't want to um, uh, give an apologia for the for the Athenians, but there is this this famous uh, uh, a case in uh, which um, uh, a woman is being charged uh, with having um, uh, inserted herself and inserted her daughter into the citizen body. So this is um, the uh, pseudo Demosthenes against Neaera. I only bring it up because um, it certainly is a case in which a woman is the target of a of a, of a legal prosecution in which. The, jury is all going to be adult males um, uh, over age 30. Um, uh, but then in the uh, 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 end of this speech of prosecution against Mayaira, um, the prosecutor um, uh, uh, says to the jurors, well, now you need to think about um, uh, when you go home. Uh, uh, and when you go home, uh, uh, what will your wife and daughter ask you? Um, they'll say, where, did, where were you today? And you will say, oh, I was, in, uh, I was in the Agora. What were you doing in the Agora? I was judging a trial. Oh, whose trial did you judge? Um, uh, I judged uh, Mayaira. And they will say, oh, that no." notorious prostitute? Um, what did you say? Will you 
men of the jury be able to answer your language anyway it's a so it was, it's an interesting little moment in which uh, uh, that the at least the attitudes of women towards what was appropriate uh, somehow entered into the background reasoning of the jurors now whether that's real, whether that's usual, we don't know. But at least it was a claim that um, uh, a prosecutor could make in an Athenian court. So um, there are ways in which, um, even when the Athenians tried to exclude women and slaves and so on from in ways that we would now regard as immoral, uh, unethical, um, tried to exclude them from uh, 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 participation, perhaps um, uh, uh, there was a, uh, an indirect um, uh, influence. Um, but once again, uh, good reason not to want to live in Athens. Um, I'm conscious that we're starting to run out of time. So I want to pivot to, uh, to one other issue before we do. Um, and I, that is the question of what forces threaten to undermine democracy. And one of the things that I think we're seeing right now in, in our own democracy is the tension between, and to, to put it one way, the tension between the rational self-interest of elected officials versus the rational collective interest of the state or the electorate, right? Um, and I wonder if uh, uh, Sara and Josh, you could just sort of talk through the ways in which you see that uh, that tension uh, being sort of dealt with in in Athens, the tension between officials, prominent individuals on the one hand, uh, and and the the collective on the other. Um, well, uh, one of the things that one can point to in this area is uh, the institution of ostracism which uh, was sort of singled out by the founding fathers as an example of the lawlessness of the, um, of the demos, of the people. Um, but it was a mechanism for getting, uh, sort of relieving this tension between a prominent individual and the democracy. Um, the idea was that you could remove uh, an, an elite citizen from the polis for 10 years um, just sort of uh, l allow a cooling off time um, if that individual was threatening um, the, the uh, integrity of the democracy. Um, and one of the reasons the founding fathers said it was irrational is because they, they didn't really understand, I think, that um, it was actually a fairly regulated um, political procedure. Um, and so one of the th things I have done in my work is try to show how it's actually a kind of a rational way of um, uh, sort of dissipating the tension that arises between a prominent uh, self-interested uh, politician and uh, the good of the, the community as a whole. And so, um, you know, one of the things that happens with that procedure is that there's, there's sort of two stages. There's, first of all, the decision in the assembly in the eighth Brittany whether to hold an ostracism. So every year they decide, are we going to hold one or not? Um, and if they decide to hold one, which is only about 10 times over the course of about two, two centuries, um, they actually gather together in the agora and cast boats, boats on potsherds. And that's how the procedure gets its name, of course, from the name Greek word for potsherd is an ostracon. So when you ostracize someone, you are basically expelling them via the, the potsherd. Uh, but the other aspect besides the two stage process is uh, that the, the individual who's exiled really only goes out of the state for 10 years, doesn't lose their property, can come back and is reintegrated into the um, into the population doesn't lose citizen rights. So it's a very, um, I argue, actually quite a moderate um, mechanism for relieving this tension rather than the kind of violent stasis and conflict between elites uh, who are fighting for power in the pre-democratic period. Um, so uh, the combination of it being a very regulated two-step process, it being fairly moderate um, and actually only being used uh, fairly infrequently um, leads me to um, sort of think about it as a, a kind of a sensible or rational uh, mechanism for relieving these tensions when an elite individual threatened to overthrow the democracy. Exactly right. Uh, the uh, big problem that uh, the social scientists um, or organizational theorists um, uh, talk about is the, is the principal agent problem. So uh, this is true of every organization um, in which there is some uh, 
uh, principle, um, that is um, uh, the one that, whose uh, desires are supposed to be fulfilled, so say the demos, um, and then there are the agents, um, those who are responsible for fulfilling those uh, desires, um, uh, so in this case um, officials uh, of various sorts. Uh, and the Athenians, I think, were much more intensely aware of the slippage um, or the potential slippage between principal and agent, demos and its agents, and they therefore created these mechanisms like auspicism, uh, like uh, annual review of um, every official um, at the end of each year. They had to go through a formal review um, uh, to make sure they hadn't misspent money or hadn't in, in, in other ways broken um, uh, the rules. Uh, we have very weak um, uh, controls uh, in the principal agent um, uh, system because of our form of representative government and because the only real control we have is um, uh, uh, elections, um, which are periodic, um, and incumbency effects are now so strong um, that elections are actually pretty weak uh, forms of control. So I think this is one place where thinking about what the Athenians were worried about, um, and, you know, I'll just put it in terms of this principal agent problem, uh, and ways that they then addressed it um, uh, might be uh, worth our thinking about, even though we're probably not going to adopt um, ostracism. I you know, periodically thought, why not? Uh, but, <laughs> uh, but, but at least it's a, I think that the, the, the thought that a workable democracy really puts a lot of emphasis about worrying about just this problem. Um, mm -hmm. And that maybe uh, when you um, feel that your own democracy is not working very well, Part of it may be because um, uh, uh, there hasn't been enough emphasis um, on the control of the various agents of we the people, that is our representatives, um, uh, and having them go off and doing things that um, in fact do not represent our collective interests in any very meaningful way. It's a, it, it's such a, ostracism is such a fascinating phenomenon. And I have to say that every time I teach it, I get this, uh, you know, a, 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 a buzz of fascination from the students uh, who very frequently will kind of turn to, to talking about whom would we ostracize if we were to, you know, have such an institution. This is sort of amazing. Um, but it's also, they're also very quick to see the dangers inherent uh, in, in that process particularly if one sort of loses the, the focus on uh, the, the careful regulation of the process that Sara so rightly emphasized earlier. Um, so I'm conscious of the time and uh, I thought I would um, uh, bring forward uh, a couple of questions that have shown up in the Q&A and, and uh, more might, might come forward as we move along. Um, so the first is from John Dawkins, who is a grad student in the, um, the history department, um, who asks um, about um, the role of the media um, in uh, recent discussions of politics and democracy in the United States. This has been obviously a, a, a huge um, uh, sphere of controversy. And he asks whether the panelists could compare the role of the media in the United States with that in the Athenian democracy, um, and whether, whether any such comparison is worthwhile. Well, um, I would, yeah, I'm not sure. If, um, when we think of the media in ancient Athens, we think of the, the statue of the, the, the tribal heroes in the center of Athens that sort of served as a public notice board uh, for when uh, assembly meetings were happening and, uh, um, and uh, they were being levied, levied for, for military service. So I don't think we have anything, the equivalent of, of the modern internet and, and, and media in the ancient world, although um, orality and word of mouth grapevine, I think is a powerful force in the ancient, ancient world, um, uh, not only among citizens, but also among slaves. And, and some of my work on slavery, I talk a, lo a lot about, um, and others have done really important work about gossip and the politics of reputation and the ways that um, oral uh, channels of communication are, can be quite powerful and quite vicious, actually. <laughs> um, but the internet and uh, all the social media are quite a different phenomenon. And I really see them as, as one of the biggest uh, threats to our democracy right now, and the ways that we're getting so polarized. Um, I do, I guess, uh, 
one thing I would say is the antidote to that such polarization, I think, is more citizen engagement. I do think that mm -hmm. we're so disengaged from the um, uh, from the process. We value our negative freedom rather than our positive freedom uh, to participate in the political process uh, too much. And I think if we um, sort of rehabilitated uh, our engagement, we'd be less manipulable because uh, we would be practiced in um, in applying our, uh, our, our um, norms and laws and um, engaging with them and making the compromises uh, that are necessary um, to, to rule ourselves for, for um, citizen self-rule. Um, but I think we're very vulnerable right now to um, the, the rumor mongering, fear mongering, um, all the basis instincts of the demos mm -hmm. are really riled up by the social media. I don't, and maybe Joss sees a, sees a, a parallel, but I don't. Um, it, it struck me as you were speaking, Sarah, that um, one of the moments when um, uh, politics in, in Athens became most divisive was at the, at the end of the fifth century, when this phenomenon of clubs was at its, seems to have been at its height. It's certainly the time when we hear the most about it. Um, and those clubs, those sort of political clubs seem to have been distinguished by um, more or less closed door meetings. Uh, among like-minded people. And it really strikes me that maybe maybe there we can edge towards some kind of a comparison, right? That absent uh, open conversations among a broader swath of people um, uh, and uh, with instead a focus on private closed door conversations among like-minded people, um, there is a tendency in a democracy for divisions to be exacerbated and for there to be more of a sort of difficulty reaching a kind of compromise and consensus. And, and maybe that's a, a comparison with what we're seeing today with the, the, the divisiveness that arises out of social media and the kind of uh, media bubbles that people are, are operating within. I, I think we have a question which is directly to, to Josh, though, if you want to come back to the media um, question, do please do. Um, and this is from uh, Dylan Kenny, and he asks about the empirical scientific rationality that you mentioned. So we talked already with religion about the ethical rationality vis-a-vis -vis the, the instrumental, but there's also that third type that you mentioned early on, and he's wondering how that scientific rationality interacted with Athenian democratic institutions. Great. Um, yeah, so I think that one of the questions the Athenians had to answer um, is how to not only achieve what they wanted, um, uh, uh, but how to uh, make sure that their desires are at least um, uh, uh, within the frame of what is achievable. Um, uh, and. Uh, uh, how to achieve things that in the end um, are going to at least allow the state to continue to exist. Um, so uh, uh, the Athenians couldn't just go to a pure form of instrumental rationality that says whatever we happen to desire and whatever we happen to believe, whatever, however coherent it is, will yield the policies that we'll make even though those policies have nothing to do with um, uh, actually being effective in the phenomenal world, right? Those policies had to gain the effects, at least in a reasonable um, uh, number of cases. Uh, and so this really, I think, does go to the, um, uh, sort of the question of scientific rationality. They had to re believe things about the phenomenal world that were true enough in order for their policies to actually pay out into the ends that they actually hoped for. Um, and this, you know, goes to the, uh, to the question once again that Plato was worried about and others have worried about, can democracy use expertise? Um, and I think that, you know, the answer actually is yes. Uh, and this goes back into the idea of um, uh, both gossip and reputation formation and so on. But the in order to be accepted as an expert in Athens, you needed to be able to demonstrate that you actually had some kind of a track record um, such that um, what you claimed was in the relevant sense true. Um, so even Plato admits this in the uh, dialogue uh, Protagoras in which um, uh, Socrates uh, sort of famously says, well, um, Protagoras, you say this and this, but I actually agree with the um, that wise Athenians, um, being a bit ironic here, um, uh, because uh, in their 
assemblies when they're talking about building ships um, uh, for a military expedition, they will only listen to those who are expert in building the ships. Um, clearly, those who are expert in building the ships have developed some kind of a reputation as actually knowing what they're talking about. Um, so uh, in this sense, I think that the ability of a democratic system to identify um, expertise and then to follow expertise, um, uh, uh, to punish those who are false experts um, uh, and to um, uh, reward those whose expertise turns out to be accurate is actually a, a key part of it. So scientific rationality can't be completely banned from the story of democracy, even if we say that you know, we're interested in the sort of baseline instrumental rationality, how did that work? Because it was also attacked by Plato. But, uh, but it's a very good point. I mean, we can't, we can't ignore that. Uh, the next question comes from uh, Danelle Padilla Peralta, who's an associate professor of classics at Princeton um, and well known uh, to, to several of us already. Um, so Danelle uh, joins us and asks, um, how do processes of racialization intersect with and continuously redefine Athenian democratic panelists? Uh, excuse me, politics. So do you want to go or I can go either way? All right. Um, uh, well, uh, this is, uh, you know, the, the, the question of, of uh, race, racialization has been uh, raised uh, for Athens, especially in the work of Susan Leip, um, who has suggested that there actually is a kind of a racial politics um, operating uh, in Athens. Um, uh, it really sort of depends on how we define the terms. Um, but there's no doubt that the Athenians thought of themselves as an ethnos, um, uh, as a group who shared um, a, some kind of a common ancestry, um, uh, and therefore the Athenians, um, who can trace back their birth to the, um, uh, uh, to the earthborn, um, uh, were part of what made them a people in common was this, this story about um, uh, uh, their shared ethnicity. Um, the fascinating thing to me is that there's an alternate story that we get in Thucydides about the Athenians being um, a completely um, uh, people who uh, were made up of folks from all over the Greek world um, who left where they lived to come to gather in Athens because Athens was a, a relatively safe place, a safe place because it was a relatively poor place back in the earliest period, according to Thucydides. Um, uh, and nobody wanted to attack it because there was nothing really to take. Um, uh, uh, so that we've got this other story that the Athenians actually are made up of the people from all over um, the Greek world, which seems to push against a kind of a, a, a racialization story. So um, I think those two are in tension, um, uh, and it's very difficult to parse out um, the ways in which an Athenian would think of himself as um, an Athenian um, and different from everyone else who was not an Athenian because of a, um, a, a racial identity um, uh, going back to the, to the earth born. And to what extent the Athenian would think that we Athenians um, are Athenians because we share some kind of um, uh, civic uh, history um, and people came here um, and were accepted here uh, 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 because um, uh, uh, of willingness to accept a, a common um, uh, set of um, norms that are ultimately played out in the classical period um, uh, in democracy. I, I wonder if we, um, we can join things together here. Danelle's question is fascinating, um, but it might intersect with the religion theme that we were talking about earlier. Um, whereas I, I think of the, the Athenian young citizen, the male young citizen was introduced to the, to the citizen body at the Apoturia through a religious ritual in which um, the father of, of the son uh, would start a, a sacrifice. Um, and if someone wished to contest the legitimacy of the new citizen, they could bring the, the animal, the sacrificial animal away from the altar. It strikes me that that is a moment um, very much um, that does hint at racialization, that there's a moment there in which um, people are identified 
somehow through the sacrifice with this kind of um, ethnos, with this this sort of uh, ancestral group and and uh, ancestry seems to be very much at stake um, with with that aperturia ritual with the father and with the possible contest of a of paternity. Um, but sorry, sorry, I introduced as a I interrupted as a non Athenian specialist, so maybe you have more pertinent thoughts. No, but you're absolutely right that there's a whole series of relig religious rituals of introducing children to the, to the family and to the fratry, the brotherhood, and ultimately to the demos, uh, the deem uh, community, when they get citizenship. And um, uh, after Pericles citizenship law in the middle of the fifth century, you have to have Athenian parents on both sides. So uh, to become a citizen, you um, there's definitely a birth criterion. Um, that said, I would like to just point out the very obvious point that um, that uh, you know, um, non-citizens were not marked by, uh, and slaves in particular, were not marked by any particular physical differences. And, and if we're to believe uh, the old oligarch, uh, there were no actual um, uh, differences in clothing or, or lifestyle between uh, citizens and slaves. You couldn't tell who was a citizen or slave when you walked along the street. And you might, if you hit someone thinking they were a slave, uh, you might be hitting a citizen. Um, so uh, there, there's, there are no differences there. And, Actually, one of the things I've been working on recently is the ways that um, there's sort of more permeability between um, citizens and non-citizens than we than we think, and that uh, uh, you know even in that case that Josh brought up about Niaira, um, she is alleged to have tried to introduce, um, uh, or her grandson is trying to uh, her grandson who is a product of her uh, slave daughter um, is uh, apparently uh, was tried tried to get into the citizen ranks. Um, and was rejected um, through through the, at the fratry level at this um, uh, brotherhood level and the ritual um, recognition by the brotherhood of the, of the child. Um, I think we hear about this case because Nyaira happened to be married to a prominent political uh, citizen. But um, but there, uh, I, I've tried to make the case in some of my work that that there's actually um, more uh, cross fertilization between citizens and non citizens than we actually are are aware of. I think that I think that certainly has to be right. Um, uh, the Athenians are clearly worried about non-citizens, as it were, coming into the citizen ranks. Where do they think it happens? They think it happens at the level of the local communities. Um, they think that the that the that the, the local villages, the deems, have been admitting people into citizen ranks, and they probably were. And why are they? doing this because they had lived with these people who were non citizens came to accept them as those who were dwelling among us. Um, uh, and so there probably is a lot of, um, uh, on the margins, um, uh, sort of winking about uh, uh, whether you are really um, the son of a native born Athenian on both sides. Um, uh, and then there's this nervousness, um, this sort of idea, oh, hold it, but we are the pure Athenians. We can't allow this to happen. So I think it's the same tension with that story about are we um, uh, Athenians sort of a hybrid people from all over Greece, or are we a pure born people from the soil? Are we um, absolutely strict about uh, maintaining the purity of our citizen body? Um, um, or are we on the margin, you know, making adjustments that allow us to go forward and it's um, uh, it's not clear and I think this is true of other it's true of the United States um, in which we get this back and forth between who are we really um, uh, and it allows for the kind of you know really vicious um, uh, uh, racialization that we see um, uh, to come out to be um, uh, uh, to become prominent in our, in our politics um, uh, but it also comes out in the sense of um, uh, the United States uh, uh, being a um, community of immigrants in a way that very few other countries in the world certainly not the European countries for the most part can claim to be or even have that as part of their uh, the way they think so I think in that sense Athens does have something familiar to us. It's that same tension that comes out in um, uh, sometimes real ugliness, um, but other times the capacity to have a kind of openness that is, is quite rare. 
I want to pose uh, one more question that came in uh, on the, the chat, and that is from Eric Gruen, uh, my emeritus colleague in, in the Departments of History and Classics. Um, and it's, it's a, a comment uh, to which I think you'll both uh, have some things to say. Um, Eric remarks, if Athenian democracy is to be used as a model or serve to shed light on modern or contemporary democracy, there are two major caveats to bear in mind. First, we know far more about Athenian democracy than about political institutions in all other polis combined. So one can hardly imagine that Athenian democracy is representative of Hellenic ideology or institutions. And secondly, one has to address the fragility of democracy in antiquity. Athens had its own up and ups and downs on this, most dramatically in the late fifth century. In that connection, and perhaps even more important, is the imposition of democracy upon states that did not voluntarily develop it, as happened in various places under the hegemony of Athens in the fifth and fourth centuries. So I can start on this, and uh, 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 sorry, I can come in. Um, uh, yes, yeah, certainly we know much more about Athens than, than, than any place else. Um, and this is in part because of the intensely democratic um, culture that developed early on in Athens. Um, uh, becomes typical of much of the Greek world, um, certainly much of the uh, world of um, uh, Western Anatolia um, in the Hellenistic period. Uh, and we see lots of Athenian-like institutions and Athenian-like practices, for example, um, uh, 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 inscribing uh, public monuments and talking about in public what they're doing in public and therefore we know um, uh, much more about Hellenistic democracies outside of Athens than we know about uh, uh, classical democracies outside of Athens. Um, so there is a kind of a spread and that and that that spread is not um, uh, at the point of a, of a spear, right? Certainly not at the point of an Athenian spear. Um, uh, so, uh, so that, that that is that is certainly true. Um, uh, uh, there is one of the fascinating things about Greek history, as opposed to. Athenian history is the great diversity of political institutions and um, political forms, um, including as you know, Emily Mackel is helped us understand more than we ever had before the um, uh, importance of what you know, is often called federalism, um, the way in which polis came together to form um, uh, new kinds of uh, collectivities. Um, uh, so uh, we can't reduce Greece to Athens, we ought not to. Um, uh, on the other hand, if what we're interested in is democracy, um, uh, uh, Athens does give us um, uh, a, a, a lot of information and that information um, uh, does become more generalized once we um, uh, go into the end of the fourth century, into the third century. Yeah, I would just add to Josh's point that, um, uh, to Josh's answer, that um, in answer to the question about Athens having its ups and downs and being a fragile democracy, um, you know, it did last for 200 years. It did have pre two brief interruptions in the late fifth century, um, two oligarchic revolutions. But um, compared to other city-states, it was remarkably stable. Um, if you think, Stasis revolution was endemic in the ancient world and other city-states and most vividly in Thucydides' account of um, Corsaira, the, the revolution at Corsaira, um, there was bloody civil war between Democrats and oligarchs. That did have happen briefly uh, in Athens at uh, the end of the fifth century, but democracy was re re reinstalled pretty quickly after that. So I think in, if we put it in its context, its ancient context, Athens is remarkably uh, stable. Um, and uh, so, um, uh, and I think sometimes we're a little bit uh, brainwashed by Thucydides, who you know, gives a, a fairly negative portrait of Athens and its tumultuous um, politics. Uh, I think we, it's, it's easy to forget that it was actually a, a regime that lasted for, for some 200 years with in, and seemed to function remarkably well. Yeah, just to give a shout out to the work of uh, uh, Scott Arsenas now at the University of Montana, who has um, done, um, I think, as much as is possible to do in terms of trying to quantify the um, frequency of stasis across the Greek world. 
And if Scott is right, um, stasis is very frequent, um, uh, probably upwards of um, a stasis in a standard Greek polis every 10 to 15 years. Um, now, they're not all of the horrific, in fact, very rarely were of the, of the horrific um, uh, Corsaira uh, level. But if we think that's right, um, or anywhere near right, um, uh, then Athens uh, looks uh, startlingly um, uh, uh, stable. A part of Scott Arsena's um, conclusions was that the two poles that we really know a lot about, Athens and Sparta, are wild outliers in this stability sense. Um, uh, and um, probably that's not coincidental. Those two are, those two, that, that uh, uh, correlation is probably not uh, uh, completely coincidental. So I think implicitly we're we're coming full circle here to the to the question with which we began, right? Which was why should we, in our current predicament, uh, be be thinking uh, about Athens? Um, I think this conversation has has led us through uh, quite a number of ways in which uh, Athens shows us both uh, the the promise and the peril uh, of. The, of the democratic experience. Um, and we've, we've looked at some of the ways in which it seems terribly fragile, uh, some of the ways in which um, uh, it, can be, it can be protected um, and uh, ways in which um, uh, collective decision-making can, can be, be strengthened against the divisiveness uh, that arises uh, in stasis or in those closed, uh, closed door private political conversations that seem so much like internet chat rooms uh, and, and social media uh, messaging. Um, so I, I, I thank uh, the panelists um, uh, for joining us today. This was really uh, a, a highlight of my, my week, my semester, getting to, getting to chat with you. Um, I thank uh, everyone who, who registered and joined us for this webinar. Um, I want to close again by, by thanking David Marno uh, for, for inviting us to organize this, um, to the BCSR staff, Rachel Park and Patty Dunlap, who helped uh, uh, organize this webinar for us. Um, thanks especially to, to everyone uh, who submitted questions uh, in this last segment of our event today. Um, so finally, thank you, Josh. Thank you, Sara. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for organizing. It was a pleasure. Uh, it's a, been a wonderful event for me. Um, so thanks to all concerned. Wonderful.